from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan, announcing show number 207, recorded live Thursday, March 18th, 2010. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with developer and author Charles Petzold about the Windows Phone 7 series. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and I'm here at Mix in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino, and I'm talking today with legendary author Charles Petzold, who has been so kind to sit down with me uh, as I run to the airport. How are you, sir? Uh, great. I'm great. I was I was thrilled to see you here, and I noticed that you're actually wearing a shirt that says Programming Windows Phone 7 Series. Yes, it's a new book. This is This is why I'm feeling so great. I am doing something I love doing most of all, which is writing a book. And it's about the new Windows Phone, and we're, we're and they're really using this week. Microsoft is using uh, Mix to tell us for the first time, tell the public what how you write apps for the Windows Phone, and that's cool. Now, for for those of the audience that may not be uh, as as old as I am, or may not have been doing Windows since before Windows three one, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the kind of the uh, the seminal book that you wrote, and and you know how that. What did you write that people know you for, sir? Uh, back in 1987, I began writing a book uh, that was eventually called Programming Windows. And this was uh, not the first, but one of the very first books about how to write apps for Windows. Uh, when I began writing the book, uh, I was targeting Windows 1.0. Uh, by the time I finished the book, I was targeting Windows 2.0. Uh, beta, I started getting beta versions about halfway through writing the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and they changed some of the screen and layout paradigms. So I had to go back and fix things as I've had that experience in writing books ever since. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, that book was published in 1988, uh, targeting Windows 2.0. Mm-hmm. And um, that uh, the sales were slow. And then in the early 90s, it went through two more editions for Windows 3.0 and Windows 3.1. And those are the editions that people really know about. Uh, I, to this day, people come up and, to me and say, I learned Windows 3.0 from your book and 3.1 from your book. So uh, it, there was a later edition for Windows 95 and then Windows 98. And that's that fifth edition, published over 10 years ago, is still in print. Really? Really. I'm still earning some royalties from it. I still get email from readers, mostly outside of the U.S. at this point, mm-hmm. uh, doing still doing Win32 API programming, which um, is something I haven't done for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a technologist or an author? I like to think of myself as an author uh, with a technology and math background. Um, I've I've written 15 books, I think. I think the total is 15. The the two books I'm proudest of are uh, the first is entitled Code, The Hidden Language of Computer Hardware and Software, Mm -hmm. uh, which is about, it's basically a how computers work book, how computers work, but it's uh, unique. If I can actually stop you, because I (laughs) wanted to bring up Code, and I'm thrilled... (laughs) Code is one of my mo- and and I know I realize that the uh, audience will realize that I'm of course of a, of a Charles Petzold fanboy. But in all seriousness, I started writing a book called Computer Zen uh, a, a number of years ago, and I I had a uh, the, I had the audience imagine a two by four of wood and put light bulbs on it, and then <laughs> someone said. Uh, this book has been written uh, already. I wrote about four chapters, and it's called Code by Charles Petzl. And I, I actually read that book, and it, I've given it as gifts. I've used it as a teaching syllabus uh, in universities. It's just a phenomenal book that takes you from the bit to the microprocessor. Thank you. It's really one of my favorite books, and I encourage people to check it out. Thank you. And it has a particularly innovative um, a cover because it has the word code in Morse code and, like, and braille, braille yes. and uh, yeah it's it's a it's a great book i'm glad i'm 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 thrilled that you're as proud of it as i much enjoyed reading it in, in the first few chapters i use morse code and braille as as uh two examples of binary codes that mm-hmm. preceded computers by uh oh a good 100 years i guess so 15 books 
And the other one I'm, I'm proudest of is the annotated touring, which uh, came out last year. And it's a, uh, a takes touring seminal paper on computability that mm-hmm. he wrote as a, a graduate student in, in 1936 and uh, annotates the hell out of it. Uh, cause the paper itself is only, uh, about 40 pages, less than 40 pages, uh, total. And, uh, I provide a lot of background to reading the paper. The paper is not easy to read. It uses a lot of weird symbols. Uh, you need to know a little, uh, background of, of, uh, why he wrote this paper. Uh, but Turing was attempting to solve a mathematical problem that was posed by David Hilbert. And in so doing, he invented uh, a a computer, an imaginary computer, uh, that can process just a very tiny number of instructions, and yet has since been proven to be equivalent to the the biggest supercomputer, except not quite as fast. At all. <laughs> one of the things that I like about about your books, and one of the reasons that I wanted to interview, was that. I've always felt when I was teaching in, 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 in university and then when I, when I do, uh, w- w- I guess you could call it teaching, but these little one hour and, and, uh, and 90 minute talks that the sense of historical context is so often missing from both technical presentations and from, uh, technical material that everyone, uh, thinks that they've invented something new and amazing. And in, in all of your books, there's, uh, there's a narrative that I think kind of respects the way we've come from and, and where we've, where we're going. I wonder if that's intentional. Uh, yes, I, I, I like history. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed history since I was in, uh, high school. And, uh, I particularly am intrigued by what's commonly referred to as the prehistory of computing. Um, the, the most obvious is, is Charles Babbage in the 19th century who designed, uh, something that, that if it were built, it would be probably the most impressive technological feat of the 19th century. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. it was never built. Um, but also things like the invention of logarithms, uh, and, uh, uh, some analog computers that are very interesting historically that, that predated digital computers. Just, uh, there's, there was a machine that was built by Vannevar Bush called the differential analyzer, which basically solved differential equations, uh, but did so using a, a bunch of, of, of pulleys and wheels and stuff. And it's just, uh, amazing. There's actually, you can see, uh, a, a little glimpse of the differential analyzer in a, um, I don't have the title of it. A, there's a science fiction f- film from the early 50s that, um. So it really existed. They built it. Oh, yeah, yeah. This was, this was built, this was built in the 1920s at Harvard. I may have all my details wrong. Mm-hmm. Or MIT. Don't worry. Our, MIT. our readers, <laughs> our readers will correct your, uh, yes. and we'll, we'll make sure that we put links in the show notes. All right. Uh, and, uh, this was, this was used a great deal for solving differential equations. As I get older, as I approach uh, approach forty, I'm starting to feel like, uh, and I always refer to this kind of archetype as the old guy with the beard. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, <laughs> when you're a programmer, you know you got to get a, you have to get that good beard going you know, before you can really get the big money. Just like the 19th century scientists. Yeah, you know. exactly. Until you've got a long white beard, they won't respect you when you go to Parliament and <laughs> make your proclamation. Uh, is this because of an increased sense of? Uh, I've seen this before that I'm feeling. Am I getting a sense of deja vu that is causing me to become cynical? Uh, as someone like you who've seen it from the very beginning to now, are you cynical or excited? It's, it's, in theory, I should be very cynical about all this stuff. But, um, I, I, by the time .NET was introduced, which, uh, I guess I first started fooling around with it in the year 2000. Does that sound right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was pretty tired of API programming mm. and, uh, I, I really welcomed a good object oriented interface to Windows. Uh, you might be thinking, what about MFC? Well, I never really got into MFC. And one reason why is that I didn't particularly like C++ as a language. It always looked ugly and clunky to me. And because it was basically glommed on to C, which was always to me a very elegant language. And, uh, MFC also itself l- seemed to be a very light wrapper on the API. I really 
couldn't see a big advantage to MFC at that time. Uh, I liked WinForms, Windows Forms, which was introduced in .NET 1.0 a lot better. And then when um, I started seeing the betas of uh, uh, what became Windows Presentation Foundation, I liked that a lot. And I think that that... To me, WPF is, is industrial strength Windows programming. So, But two questions about WPF and, and, and that. One is, when I first saw XAML, I said, oh, it's resource files again. <laughs> resource know, files on steroids. Yeah, yes. except they're more verbose, right? <laughs> yes. And then my second question is, why is it so hard to learn? Why is the, is it the number? Is it concept count or is it that we haven't found the right narrative? Uh, the, is XAML the hard to learn? Or, yeah, just or? sitting down and busting out XAML. Uh, I remember the first time I tried to learn HTML tables. Mm. I think I spent about three days, and then one day it clicked, and now I can make a table with right, a call span right. with the best of them. Of course, that's no longer a useful skill. Now it's something else. I, I, I think I think XAML is is somewhat similar in that respect. Uh, there are some uh, conceptual and syntactical oddities of XAML. I'm thinking of uh, property property element syntax, mm -hmm. where you define a, a uh, if a property cannot be expressed, if the value of a property cannot be expressed in a text string, you need to break out the property as a property element as separate tags and then define the property like so. Um, I remember my pain and confusion in encountering this syntax for the first time. Uh, so when I'm writing about XAML, I take special care to discuss this syntax to point it out how weird it is, uh, how it almost looks like an extension to XML, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's really not. It's, it's, XAML seems very kind of uh, ver verbose, but we haven't created a designer yet, although maybe Blend is getting close, that we can truly hide it. It feels like when we did front page and HTML, you know, you could tell when someone wrote their HTML with a designer. It's, uh, to me... XAML is not verbose because if you if you put XAML side by side with the equivalent C sharp code, that XAML is shorter. Yeah. In almost all the cases, even with the uh, oh, C sharp is getting close with the the new the new syntax uh, where you can use angle brackets and define the properties when you're constructing an object. Uh, but the XAML is usually more concise. Uh, I have. All of the XAML that I have published in books and articles, I've handwritten. Uh, I have been, I am one of these people who is extremely reluctant to have tools, even Visual Studio, mm -hmm. even Visual Studio, generate XAML for me. So I, plus I have not come across a good way of, of, uh, teaching people how to program by pulling controls over onto the surface of a, a mm -hmm. window. That, to me, is not programming. I, I want to focus on the syntax, and I want to get programmers accustomed to writing this stuff for themselves. So when they eventually go to Expression Blend, which they will, I, I have no doubt of that, they'll at least understand what it's, what it's generating. Mm -hmm. um, also, I, I, I do a little consulting. I, I, unfortunately, I do more consulting these days than I have needed to in the past. I, I saw, I worked on a WPF kiosk app, uh, that they used, obviously used expression blend to generate some, a bunch of animations. Uh, they had this thing where you had a bunch of tiles on the screen and when you picked one, it got bigger. The others got smaller. They moved around a bit. Somebody had gone into Expression Blend and defined individual animations for all these things. And, of course, you had to have uh, a dozen different variations of because there were 12 different tiles. So when each tile got bigger, the others got smaller and moved to unique places around the screen. This was pages and pages and pages of XAML animation, all of which I threw out and replaced with a custom panel. Uh, which to me was the obvious way to go. And uh, it took about a day and a half of work. They mm -hmm. had slotted about uh, two weeks of work for me on this. <laughs> I was finished in a day and a half with a custom panel that, that uh, applied all the animations in code that were, were needed. Uh, it's relying on 
XAML generation tools and other tools can be very dangerous. Unless you really know what's happening. Unless right? you know what's happening. And, and it, you have to, you have to learn how to write it by hand first and you have to know the right way to do things. And you, you, you kind of allude to an interesting point that I've always, I've never really got a good satisfying answer to, which is the, when do I use XAML or when do I use code? Because initially when this was introduced, there was almost this sense of, I should feel guilty or bad if I somehow have to drop into code behind. And like, you should be able to do these amazing things in XAML. So you just said a custom panel. Did you write code behind to help do that? That's uh, custom panels are written entirely in code. There's no XAML involved with that. Ah. Uh, another thing I've seen is that programmers no longer who have been working with WPF for a while no longer know how to create a button in code. <laughs> and this to me is, is if you've lost that skill, there's something wrong. So what, what is the responsibility of XAML? And what is the responsibility of code I, behind? Because as I we like, move towards, I like, I I use XAML a lot, and I'm 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 a uh, in one sense, I'm a XAML fiend. I like doing things in XAML that nobody else has done in XAML. I mm -hmm. did a, a complete clock application in XAML, which it was very, very hard because you XAML can't perform arithmetic, and I needed to perform arithmetic. <laughs> uh, and you just did this as a as an exercise? Yeah, it's in it's in the. I did a blog post about it, and I did it in the in. I put it in my book, and basically, because XAML itself can't do arithmetic. I use transform groups to perform arithmetic. So I, I basically set up uh, groups of transforms, uh, and when you set up a group of transforms, they multiply by each other, and and uh, a bunch of data bindings, and and the whole thing was done in XAML. Um, that's really a macho programming thing, though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I like the way I can XAML mimics the layout structure of a window. Uh, and I, I try to do as much in XAML as I can with, with that layout and with data bindings. Uh, you need code for event handling. Um, but I, there are cases where it's just, it just makes more sense to define an animation in code and, mm -hmm. and apply it. And you, know, it's, you learn which way to go. After years of experience, and there's no right because this is programming, because right. this is part art as well as engineering. Yeah, there true. is no right answer as well. W would you say that it's a, a good idea to create custom controls in code and then express them as XAML? That that's the real power. Uh, there is a very popular technique, both in WPF and Silverlight, of of a user control, which is uh, you derive from user control, and it's basically a layout of other controls and elements. Uh, that define the visual appearance of the control. I, I, that is a very useful technique. Uh, on the other hand, I've done things like, um, ex if you want to extend a scroll bar, if you want to add a couple more properties to a scroll bar, it's good to do that in code and then define the visual appearance with a template. Again, in XAML. Um, anything that's very visual is proper to do in XAML. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman from another Parallel Universe. Got to tell you about some of our things our sponsors are doing. They make this free podcast possible. If you're developing a new line of business application, you've probably tried the latest version of Serverlight. Now you can get even better results by combining the functionality in Serverlight 4 beta with some of the richness of the third-party controls from our friends at Telerik. They're the first vendors to offer native support for the Serverlight 4 beta and their RAD controls. They've got a new Serverlight 4 CTP suite of these controls. They let you tap into the framework's great potential. You get native right mouse click and all the new features of Silverline. There's 38 controls that uh, give you all these features. You can start building those compelling line of business applications right away. I encourage you to check those products out at Telerik.com slash Silverlight. And, uh, you know, thank Telerik for supporting uh, .NET Rocks, supporting Hansel Minutes on their Facebook fan page at Facebook.com slash Telerik. Now back to the show. So... Speaking to, to things that are proper and correct, uh, as we move into Windows Phone 7, I'm starting to realize that they really are going to hold us to this aesthetic. Before, you could make green buttons and purple backgrounds and nobody said anything. Well, there is a, a one good reason for imposing a particular aesthetic on the phone, and it is this. Uh, phones are very sensitive to battery life. You want to extend that battery as much as possible. These these phones the, the, the are using OLED technology, organic LEDs, mm -hmm. 
I don't think you're actually made from living things. I, I don't know. But what, one of the things about OLEDs is that they have longer, they, they don't use as much power as conventional LEDs, but only if the screen is very dark. If the screen is very light, they will use more power than a conventional LED. If the screen is very dark, they will use a lot less power. So this, it, uh, uh, what is the, what is the general rule when our aesthetics follows from our technology limitations? Yeah. But this, this is why the aesthetic is, is on the phone is very dark backgrounds with this light spindly text. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that the, the, this metro thing that they've created, it also, takes advantage of uh we we realize that there are things off screen and this might be a little bit obtuse but you know the uh, jacob nielsen said that users will never scroll and i think what was underlying that because jacob nielsen was a usability engineer was that users cannot conceive of objects off screen right just like babies for a very long time never understand that there are objects when you take it out of their sight of vision but now fast forward the entire world has matured the f- they're saying that the phone is a window on a larger panorama. It, it, there's an interesting analogy. When when motion pictures were first created, uh, people thought that audiences wouldn't n- wouldn't follow cuts. They wouldn't be able to understand when when the movie cut between two different scenes that they were actually happening simultaneously. And of course, audiences picked this up right away. Uh, so yeah, the the uh, exactly that that the. They are, they do have a layout on the phone that implies horizontal scrolling because things go off to, off to the side. And, uh, I, I, it's, it's very interesting partially because it's the whole look of Windows phone is so unlike any other smartphone in the market. It's really going to distinguish itself in, in, in that aspect as well. What do you think about the decision for them to make it only managed code? I think that's an excellent decision. I am very much in favor uh, uh, of managed code. Um, I that may sound odd from somebody say, who started was, off in assembly this language. Part, this is the part where I say, "You of all people, <laughs> me of all people." Uh, I I I started off with uh, uh, well, I really started off with Fortran, but I spent a lot of time with assembly language mm-hmm. on the eighty eighty and the Z eighty and the eighty eighty six. I spent a lot of time with C. Uh, I, when I, because of my assembly language background, I was very good with pointers in C. Uh, but I have, even though I was a little reluctant, mm-hmm. um, skeptical, I have come around to see the wisdom of managed code. It just, there are certain types of errors, certain types of common bugs that are just impossible in managed code. And, and to me, this, this is the most important aspect of it. Uh, it's it, the programs are a lot easier to get running, uh, and a lot easier to debug, and they're just not as buggy as as traditional programs. So this move to managed code is something that I am very much in favor of. Mm-hmm. Do you think that when when people say, "Well, I'm frustrated that they won't let me code in C plus plus or C on this phone," that there's is that rooted in fear? And I'm assuming fear that I will be unable to do something. Uh, partially. I, I heard a lot of this in the early days of .NET, that there were certain things people wanted to do, uh, partially with string handling, because strings are immutable in, in, in .NET, and, and, uh, some certain kinds of string handling become very clumsy. Uh, there is a lot of reluctance among the game developers, gaming developers, to move to managed code, because, and they have more of an argument because they're accustomed to getting very low down uh, next to the hardware, and uh, they are not accustomed to garbage collection. And garbage collection is a serious problem in, in games, because it, it, if you are, uh, you're going at a frame rate of 30 frames per second, if you are allocating uh, from the local heap 30 times a second, uh, there's going to be a garbage collection. And when there's a garbage collection, your game's going to stutter, and that's not a good thing. Uh, so... Uh, a lot of the move to managed code in in games has been uh, an awareness of the garbage collection problem, and a, vo- uh, a lot of uh, the s- types of of uh, objects that you would normally uh, be allocating thirty times a second during your, your game loop 
in XNA, a lot of these are structures rather than classes, so they don't get allocated from the local heap. But you still have to be aware of, of this problem, and you just have to avoid local heap allocations on a, and, and, That'll help. That'll, <laughs> that'll you, solve the, the garbage collection problem. <laughs> and couldn't you pre-allocate? The, yes, that's another, that's another technique. You, you can have a cache of objects mm-hmm. uh, that, that are pre-ready for you and reuse them. Yes. Yes. There are, n- there are numerous techniques to deal with this problem, mm-hmm. but it's... I can it's, understand why I'd be afraid. Yes. It's something that, that game developers are, are, are nervous about. And, and, and rightfully so. They're going to have to learn some, some new techniques. So... If I want to learn how to program Windows Phone, uh, then I'm I'm going to buy the book. I'm going to buy the Petzl book. Thank you. Which well, you don't have to buy it actually. Uh, this book is going to the the completed book will be available later this year as a free download, and uh, the first 150 pages that I've written are available now as a free download. Uh, if you go to my website charlespetzl.com on the home page, you'll have links. There are links provided. There's also a link to the PDF file on the the portal to the Windows Phone developer page, which is developer.windowsphone.com. Very important website to know about. So it's free. It's, it's free. free. It's absolutely free. Is it, and it, now, is this a book or a, a it's, pamphlet? It's a, it's a book. I, the, the, the excerpt <laughs> that I finished in time for Mix is 150 pages. 100, that's an excerpt. So we're looking and at 100. This is a real book. This it's a is, this is going to be with a big spine. The contract, the contract says, yeah, a big spine, but virtually speaking, well, because virtually it's a download. <laughs> <laughs> a big giant PDF or XPS file. Um, the contract calls for 400 pages. I, oh, that's a book. Frankly, I think it's going to be, um, the original contract for programming Windows called for a book of about 400 pages. Uh-oh. And the first edition was more like 800. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. I, <laughs> I love writing books. I love, Par- partially it's it's the, the 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 process of building the book from from nothing from just mm-hmm. words but it's it's the challenges of organizing the material into a a narrative uh that the reader can follow from beginning to end unfortunately uh although in the past people used to read books like this um I, a lot of people tell me about their experience of reading programming windows from cover to cover uh, unfortunately, people don't do that much anymore, but it's still, I'm not sure I can write a book otherwise. And for, for a reader who jumps into it just to learn one little topic, I don't know. Do you, do you struggle with the concept? I mean, the, the, the writing a book is as much about you putting pen to paper as it is about effectively absorb, uh, getting someone to absorb that information into their brain. And because of the way time operates, they have to do it in a fairly linear fashion. And they may be flipping around in the book, but by flipping around the book and reading chapters in a different order, they're simply reading a different book. Yes. Uh, there is, I take a lot of time and, and thought to put my chapters in the right order. Uh, each chapter builds on the chapter previously. I try to pace the introduction of materials so it doesn't overwhelm the reader. Uh, you also want to keep up the reader's interest. Um, but there is, uh, in learning programming, there is a, a point at which you need to start and the knowledge is accumulated over, 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 uh, a long period of time. And I, I like to mimic that process. Uh, it's, it's a little odd doing it these days because I am well aware that a lot of programmers simply don't learn like that anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, partially it's because they don't have time. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, lots of new technologies you have to keep up with. And, uh, it's, it's not like back in the early nineties where every MS DOS developer realized I am going to need to learn Windows and this is going to be something I'll be using for the next 10 or 20 years and hence I can afford spending the time to learn it properly in a, in a tutorial manner. That's a really interesting point because you're saying that people may be less interested in investing deeply in a technology if they can't trust that it's there 
tomorrow. Exactly. And the technologies uh, ch- change so quickly, and there's so many of them. And, and uh, our development tools have made it very easy. If you, if you boot up Visual Studio, you can have a Silverlight or an XNA program running. doesn't do much, but you can run it just by pressing F5. <laughs> So how are you gonna how are you gonna write this book? I haven't read the the excerpt yet, but you have to assume a couple of things. You have to assume that uh, reader A is a programmer professional yes. using Silverlight for years, and that reader B is a nineteen year old who's never programmed in his life. I I uh, I assume that the reader is a programmer. I have okay. to do that. Right. I assume that the reader knows .NET and C Sharp. If okay. not, I have a online book on my website called, uh, it's, it, this is a, a rather shorter book. It's called .NET Book Zero. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's an introduction to .NET and C Sharp for the C or C++ programmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, beyond that, I, I can't do anything. Um, okay. I, I start off assuming the book's going to be bo- both about Silverlight and XNA, which are the two, uh, programming interfaces on Windows Phone. And I start off, uh, with, I'm, I'm covering both of them. I start off assuming that the reader doesn't know either one. That's what I want to know. So you're assuming that they don't know XAML, they don't know WPF, they don't know Silverlight. If your readers haven't been here at Mix, they might have not have heard the exciting news about that Windows Phone will support both Silverlight and XNA. Uh, so uh, Silverlight will be used mostly for what we think of as applications and utilities, uh, calculators and, and, uh, uh, anything with a list box will be Silverlight, uh, whereas XNA is is for games, 2D and 3D games. And you're going to cover both of them. I'm the going to cover both of them. So it's two books, in fact. It's we had a discussion about this whether it should really be two books rather than one book, uh, because there will be programmers, there will be programmers who will never learn XNA for the phone, and there will be programmers who will never learn mm-hmm. Silverlight for the phone. I'd like to see programmers learn both. Uh, I think that if you're going to be a, a good Windows Phone programmer, you should you should know both. You should know when to use Silverlight. You should know when to use XNA. You can use some of the framework from XNA in your Silverlight app, and vice versa. Visually, all mm-hmm. your the two the two output paradigms are very different. So either your app is a Silverlight app or an XNA app. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can't mix them visually at this time. That may come sometime in the future. Uh, But they are very two different paradigms, and they are different enough so that you can jump back and forth between them Mm -hmm. without getting confused. Really? Yes. And uh, and they're they're both in .NET. They share core libraries. If I want to open a file and run around in a I got, I don't know, I assume isolated I have files. storage. <laughs> I'm going to run around in isolated storage and, and read data. I'm using the same API oh, as an XNL. Absolutely. And if I want to talk to the microphone absolutely. and get the raw feed from the microphone. Yes, there are, there is an XNA, uh, classes to do that and you can access those from your Silverlight app. Mm-hmm. So, well, I, I, I have to, Complete ignorance on XNA because I, I know a lot of people who've done it. I have friends who put out XNA games, but I've never really sat down and looked at that. Can you give me a brief sense of what, what does an XNA application look like? How do I get things on the screen? Okay, in in an XNA app, you're dealing almost. Ex- let's let's stick to 2D at the moment. Sure. Uh, in an XNA app, uh, you're dealing entirely with bitmaps, even and they're called textures. Even your your text is a bitmap. You go back to bitmap style text. And, uh, you, uh, have a method that you override called draw. And during this method, uh, this draw method is called, uh, 30 times a second, You're the, which is the frame rate on the, the Windows phone. On a, on a PC, it would be called 60 times a second or 70 times a second. And it's, you basically draw your entire screen at that point, all your bitmaps <laughs> right out to the screen. Uh, to prepare for that draw, uh, method. You have another method called update, where you perform all the calculations. These two methods are separated because of some timing issues. If you can't quite keep up with the frame rate, uh, but you're you're basically on a frame by frame basis. You're you're doing all your calculations for all the the uh, locations of all the little sprites uh, on the screen. Uh, you're also polling for input during the the uh, the update method. Uh, so it's very much um, drawing basic bitmaps and polling for input, uh, whereas in, in Silverlight, 
you all your input comes through events and you are uh even though somewhere in the composition level uh things are being redrawn at the screen refresh rate you you really just put them there once and they stay there it's a retain mode graphic system so if I'm spitting out this uh, this entire screen, and I mean my my knowledge of Windows uh, graphics programming actually ended, I think, in the GDI days. So it, both both Silverlight and XNA are very different from GDI. <laughs> okay. Well, see, I was going to ask there that you're saying I'm I'm thinking to myself as an old school programmer, like, am I double buffering? Do I just do I, does it handle it for me? There is a it's all there is a XNA is a, is double buffered. Yes, yes. You are writing to what's called a back buffer, and then that is updated to the screen, the actual screen. So it's very much a, 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 a raw, you have complete yes. control of what's going on. Yes, which is what game programmers like. Okay. So, you know, for the person who wishes that they had C++, maybe they really just need to check out XNA. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I have enjoyed XNA programming precisely because I, I've, I feel very, very low in, 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 in the uh, uh, technological hierarchy. And uh, the, the the book is going to include not just graphics and Silverlight and XNA, but is it going to also include some of the more services based things? Are we going to be able to talk it's, to? It's X, interesting. There's Xbox? there's a lot. There's a real there's a real uh, web service um, uh, orientation to the the Windows Phone and including Xbox Live. Um, I am currently discussing with with my publisher, who is Microsoft Press, about stuff that I won't put in the book. Mm. to allow other authors to give better treatment to it. And I am considering, I have not yet made the decision, but I am considering that the maybe uh, the programs in my book will be very self-contained uh, and will not be using web services. Uh, aside from, there's a location service that I just... So I, could, there's some ubiquitous services, intrinsic services that are part of the phone, right? Yeah. Well, the location is 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 a, is considered to be a web service, but it is it is uh, there's there's actual uh, classes for for location. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and it does speak over the wire in some way. Yeah. It, the location is interesting. It's it's called a GPS, which I believe means assisted GPS, and the, uh, mm -hmm. the 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 phone is a GPS device, so it can get GPS information. But GPS is often slow. Uh, it takes a while to, to get the information. Um, it's no good indoors. So they use other techniques to help out with GPS, uh, including uh, Wi-Fi. They try to figure out location from Wi-Fi. And they try to figure out location from uh, cell towers. And you can choose whether you want fast location that's not so accurate or, or slow location that's very accurate. Uh, and... GPS is considered slow but accurate. Well, it definitely seems like an important topic to cover. Yes. But I see that programming Windows uh, Phone 7 Series Network Edition is almost a whole book in oh, itself. Oh, yes, absolutely. I absolutely. could cover cloud and uh, OData and WCF yes, and all yes, those kind of I, things. Yes. I, can see your, I can see your challenge. Well, this has been fantastic, sir. I really appreciate you um, sitting down with me today. Oh, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. So you can make sure that you check out Charles's blog at charlespetzel.com. You can download his book, as, and you can also go and buy code and some of the other great books that he's bought, as well as checking out the Windows Phone Developer Portal at developer.windowsphone.com. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'll see you again next week.